Hey, this is Oteal. If you're liking what you're hearing, head on over to patreon.com forward slash comes a time pod and get your bus pass for an extra episode every week. Welcome back to another episode of Comes a Time. That is Oteal. And that is Mike. It's my COVID test. I'm out on the road now. (laughs) Testing myself every day now. Oh, is that what it is now? You have to do it yourself? (laughs) Oh, geez. Well, let's hope for a, a negative. Today on the, uh, on the podcast, we were joined. What an, what an unbelievable chat. Um, Joe Corsello, who has played with Sonny, Ro- I mean, Sonny Rollins, Benny Goodman, <laughs> Peggy Lee, um, and so many others. And yeah. that's just the tip of the iceberg of his amazing story um, throughout his career and uh throughout his life and starting at what did you say five years old playing yeah. the drums same age i started wow that is really uh <laughs> it's hard to watch isn't it? <laughs> yeah. this whole episode's just full of surprises <laughs> i gotta get it done i'm running no, out of time to. before yeah. i gotta no. go to you also you also can't have it open too long i think you have to <laughs> take the test before it expires i learned that i I opened one and then it was like oh it's been open for an hour you can't use it but um (laughs) this was quite a chat yeah um really meaningful yeah and joe joe i called you the day after this happened because i knew you would love that story yeah i got to do i got to do stand up at a at a cigar lounge and um it just had that feeling like it was like just this room had we weren't the only ones there there were some ghosts hanging around, and I mentioned, I just said, it, you know, ad-libbing. I was kind of like, these ghosts are waiting for us to get out so they can put on some Benny Goodman and dance around, and everybody kind of, I heard a little shuffle in the back, and later on, they came up to me, and they were like, you know, that's Joe. He, he was the drummer for Benny Goodman, and I'm like, what? Like, of all the people I, ch- like, I didn't think about that. I don't have a Benny Goodman bit. Like, it was just yeah, that there was popped no, out. There was no pictures of Benny Goodman up at Nothing. the club. Nothing. Nothing. It was just yeah. a like a lead in. It was to just a, random. <laughs> a coincidence. Yeah, one of those. And then we ended up chatting for quite a while and he's just got such a like a great spirit and he was like happy and just th- kept thanking me for doing the show and, and all of that. And uh, we wanted to have him on because, you know, everybody's story is, yeah. is so important to hear. And this is quite a story. Yeah, we didn't think it was random, so no, we, were like, we did not. Yeah, I guess we should get him on. Yeah. And wow, what a, what a. Uh, his life is definitely like jazz. We can't even spoiler do any spoilers. Like, <laughs> you just gotta listen to this story. It goes where you would never guess a number of times, and a number of times, like yeah, like wow. And you hit the nail on the head when you said that it's a jazz it's, tale. Yeah. yeah. The whole, yeah, his the arc of his life is very jazz like. Because I didn't think he was gonna say, "Oh, so I did it." And we we're like, "What?" Okay, so, but yeah, we'll be- yeah. So just yeah, we'll we'll end here and let you guys go listen. But thank you to Joe, uh, very very much for for joining us. And uh, we're on we're on Osiris, home to so many great podcasts. Check him out at OsirisPod.com. And if you're uh, enjoying what you're hearing. Join us over at patreon.com forward slash comes a time pod for bonus episodes every week. Take care of yourselves and O'Teal have great shows. We Thank love you. you. We can't wait to see you rolling through town and have Peace, more everybody. great comedy shows too. You got it. Bye everyone. Thanks for joining us today, Joe. Uh, really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me, first of all. We're excited to, to chat with you. We met at a, in a very uh, interesting way. I had, I had told O'Teal about how we, I had done stand-up at the, at the cigar company in Stanford, Connecticut. And mm-hmm. uh, during my set, I mentioned that there were probably a lot of really great ghosts hanging around the room. And they said they couldn't wait until uh, we left and they would put on some Benny Goodman and dance around. I had no idea until afterwards you came up and you said, it's interesting you said Benny Goodman because I played drums in Benny Goodman's band. 
And I had never said anything like that before on stage <laughs> or anything. So I said, wow, we were supposed to meet. So we had a great chat. So oh, that, that, that's really interesting. Well, I had, to, I, I had to go change my pants after I heard your comedy set because I had never laughed so hard in my life. <laughs> oh, so God. <laughs> I thought that was a riot. That was a well, riot. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Appreciate well, shout out to, that. yeah, the cigar company is great. They, it's a really cool room to, um, to hang out, but they, the owner introduced me to you and I came back and, you know, uh, we both love, Otil and I both love jazz and the, the whole history of it. So we were really dying to, to chat with you. Yes. Yeah. 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 It blew my mind when he told me that story. I was like, no way. He's serious, man. Cause I love <laughs> Benny Goodman. One of my, uh, Favorite records is this Charlie Christian record. Oh, yeah. You know. That's an oldie. That's yeah. an oldie. Yeah. yeah. I only I had the pleasure of doing one record uh, with Benny, and it was called uh, The King Swings. I guess you can still get it on Amazon. Um, and the band was unbelievable. Uh, at the time, we had uh, Bucky Pizzarelli on guitar, mm. Slam Stewart on bass. Oh. Zoot Sims on alf, on uh, tenor, John Bunch on piano. Uh, I'm trying to think about Irby Green on trombone. The band was great. Oh, oh my and we goodness! Did, yeah, we did a world tour. We, you know, we did a lot of recording up at Benny's uh, house here in Stanford. He had a a, a bathhouse uh, attached to a swimming pool, oh, and wow. um, the CBS used to come up all the time with their trucks and their cables, and they used to record us, but. I understand none of that stuff came out on Columbia. It was all brought to the archives up at Yale University, and that's where it's been sitting mm. since. But there was a lot of really great music. Man, please tell me one Slam Stewart story because he's just, <laughs> you know, uh, for a lot of our fans, if you haven't heard him, you should go do so. He used to do these solos where he would uh, bow the bass and hum along with it. Oh, he was great. The most he was coolest great. sound you've ever heard in your life. Oh, wow. It's, it's, he, no he was such a he was such a sweetheart too. Uh, he and I became really good friends. I uh, lived up in uh, Binghamton, New York, and uh, uh, he used to come down to Stanford because a lot of times he would take the, the plane, obviously from Kennedy, and uh, so we would hang and and we just became like really really good friends. And, um, you know, three o'clock in the morning at the Hotel Gresham in uh, Dublin, we were doing a we were doing a jazz festival there. And three o'clock in the morning, somebody's knocking on my door, and it would be Slam with a bottle of scotch. Come on, Joe, what's up? <laughs> you know, but he was just he was phenomenal. You know, um, at the time I was probably nineteen or twenty years old uh, when I joined wow. Benny, and uh, I really didn't have to do much because when you had Bucky Pizzarelli. And you had Slam Stewart. You just basically just put two sticks in your hands and just did whatever you felt like doing. Yeah. I mean, those guys were monsters. Oh man, I learned so much from those two guys. Yeah, God. but he was a sweetheart. He was a sweetheart. Yeah, yeah. And, and how did how did all of that come about? Like, how did you get to know those guys or get that opportunity? Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly. I don't know if I was with Peggy Lee first. Or if Peggy Lee came to see me with Benny, or Benny came to see me with Peggy Lee, it was it was it was in the early seventies. It was around nineteen seventy one, seventy two, and uh, Paul McCartney had written uh, uh, done all the music for Peggy. Uh, it was probably her last album too. It was called Let's Love, and um, so we were going to go on tour with it. And uh, when I say on tour, we would bring you know, the four rhythm players, the piano player, the conductor, guitar, myself, Joe Beck was the guitar player. And, mm. and, and he was absolutely, he was a phenomenon. But anyway, um, and then we would pick up the orchestras wherever we would go. And we would do these two week stints and, you know, and promote the record. And of course you would do all the other songs like Fever, and, you know, all the other hits that she had. But uh, I think Benny Goodman was in the audience at the uh, Plaza Hotel in New York City. And, um, the next thing I know, I got a letter from uh, Muriel Zuckerman. Uh, that was his secretary and uh, uh, kind of agent. And, um, and I said, uh, Benny Goodman would like for you to join the Sextet. And uh, we're, gonna, uh, we're starting the tour at the Eastman Theater up in Rochester, New York. And I thought it was pretty funny because I thought Benny Goodman had died like maybe, you know, <laughs> 20 years before. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, 
I was like, this is going to be pretty good. You know, I'm going to play in front of 10 or 20 people. This is going to be pretty funny, you know? So anyway, I, I fly up to, uh, I fly up to uh, Rochester and get my drums. You know, back then we didn't have backline kits or anything. So as you know, I had to bring all my own crap, which sucked. But in any event, I got all the stuff up there and set up and I saw chairs up on the stage and the, the, uh, the Eastman Theater holds about 2000 people. And I saw stairs, all uh, chairs all around the bandstand. And I said, what the hell are these chairs for? You know, I thought that was kind of weird. But in any event, um, when I walked out on stage, there was, <laughs> it was absolutely packed mob, standing room only. And it was like I was playing with the Beatles. It was just insane. <laughs> wow. I mean, people screaming and clapping. And I was like, holy smokes. So I got to, you know, obviously at that point, I got to meet Benny and, um, Ironically, Benny said, uh, uh, you know, you live in Stanford, Connecticut? I said, yeah. And he said, where do you live? And I said, and I told him, and he said, that's about a mile down the street from my house. Do you realize that? And I said, no, I didn't realize that. And uh, he lived up on Rock Rim and Road right by the golf course. And uh, <clears throat> so we became really good friends. Uh, Sunday afternoons, he would call me to go up to his house. Uh, he and Alice would have martinis and we would sit. And then my ex-wife and I, and uh, would sit and, you know, we would laugh and talk, tell old stories, or he would tell his old stories. And at one, one Sunday, I remember he was telling me uh, that he was cleaning out his attic above the garage. And he said, would I be interested in having Gene Krupa's drum set? Because oh. he had passed away. Uh, you know, you'll oh, love this. happens this. to be in his attic. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, the original drum set. Yeah, Whoa. it's BG and, and yeah. K on the front. And uh, I said, oh, Ben, are you kidding? And my ex-wife, and now, now you'll know why she's my ex-wife. She said, oh, Benny, he doesn't want those. He's got six drum sets now. Where are we going to put them? And that ended that conversation. And I guess the drums went in the dumpster and that took care of that. So anyway, that's why she's my ex-wife. And that's, <laughs> that's how we started. We, uh, then he asked me if I, if I wanted to go on tour with him. He had a couple of world tours. So I ended up doing three with Benny. And uh, it was just phenomenal. It was great. And the way he used to get rid of musicians, you know, there's a lot of bad stories about Benny. You know, he, he had that ray about him. And if he stared at you, it was, uh, uh, you knew you were finished. And he would, uh, his, uh, uh, I guess it was his uh, clarinet tech, I guess like a drum tech, who kind of set everything up for us and got us on the, uh, you know, on the bus and then the limousines on time. And he would go up to the musician and say, can we borrow your tuxedo jacket? We're going to go have it cleaned. Oh, was, that was the end of your tour. <laughs> oh, wow. That's so that's, so cool. that, uh, unfortunately, that never happened with me. <laughs> but no, he was, he was a thrill. He was a thrill to play with. And he was very, very difficult to work for because he was a perfectionist. And, uh, you know, a lot of concerts we would do, uh, like with Syracuse Symphony or the Rochester Symphony or the, whatever symphony we would go out and play with. He would go out first and do like the uh, clarinet concerto and B flat and just played the crap out of it. And I was like, oh, my God. And I would sit there with my mouth open. And then all of a sudden, you know, we'd come on stage and he'd start playing this outrageous jazz. And it was just it was so much fun. I really had a lot of fun with those guys. Yeah. So can I rewind a little bit before you said you got to meet him after the show? Did you play with him and not rehearse with him? First? No, no, there was no rehearsal. You just so hit the stage. Yeah, just went up to uh, Rochester, and I guess I guess that was my audition. He wanted to see how I was going to perform, and then at that Holy point cow. we we would rehearse. Then we would start rehearsing. We <laughs> we go to his house in Manhattan and rehearse there, or we rehearse at his uh, bathhouse up in, uh, you know. But Benny was such. A, <laughs> I got you guys being comedians, you'll get a kick out of this. We were we were rehearsing one day, and it was and it was uh, uh, he had a girl singer. I remember he wanted to try out. She, was, she wasn't that good but she said uh we were in the bathhouse and i guess it was in like march she said benny she said i am freezing it's so cold in here and benny looked at her and goes oh you think it's cold and she said yeah i'm freezing so benny left and came back and he was wearing a sweater <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> that's, the guy, that's the kind of wow. guy benny was <laughs> <laughs> that's messed up wow. yeah <laughs> But, you know, Eric, you know, too, I mean, you know, I mean, you guys, you know, have, have played with some heavyweights and, um, you know, like when, even with Sonny Rollins, uh, when I when I did uh, six years with Sonny Rollins and, you know, he was uh, he was a wonderful man, wonderful. We talk on the phone. He's 94 years old. We talk and 
he's ready to go to the next universe. And, you know, he's unfortunately, he's not playing anymore. He retired. So I'm out of work in any event, you know, just talking <sighs> to him and, and uh, the, you know, the, the mannerisms and everything that these guys have when they're on stage and when they're off stage and when you're hanging out with them, and, you know, just the, just the stories alone are just phenomenal, you know, especially an icon like Sonny Rollins. I mean, it's just, wow. You know? yeah. I was more, I was a lot more nervous with Sonny than I was with Benny. Well, you thought Benny had been dead for 20 years. <laughs> You're just happy he was alive. <laughs> you know, my father, when well, my father saw the letter, because on the envelope, it's got a picture of a clarinet and it says, you know, Benny wow. Goodman offices. And, the, and my father flipped out because, you know, yeah. my father was a, was a big lover of Benny Goodman. And uh, uh, my dad, by the way, and that's how I even got involved in music. My dad was the original Hawaiian guitarist with Swing and Sway with Sammy Kay. And when I was a little kid, I used to watch my dad on TV all the time because Sammy Kay was on every Saturday night. And the musicians would come over to our house and the drummer one day came over with a snare drum on a broken cymbal and a broken bass drum. And so that's really how I got started. And I was about five years old. So it was, wow. it was quite a beginning. Yeah. Huh. So was he, was he traveling a lot playing when you were younger? Uh, he was, yeah, my dad was, my dad would travel with uh, Sammy K and they would, uh, you know, they play all these big ballrooms, all these big dances and everything. But on Saturday night, they would be on TV coming uh, from New York and uh, you know, I'd watch him on this little 10 inch TV, black and white TV. And it was pretty cool. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So you got the bug early. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Five years old. Yeah. And I started. You know, I, I started uh, taking drum lessons probably at six or seven years old and played drums all through high school, got accepted to Berklee College of Music. I went up there in 64, where it was just a little, little college. It was just a little house. It's a bar now uh, where it used to be. <laughs> wow. and, uh, it was 250 students. And uh, it started off as an accordion school. Lee Burke uh, uh, taught accordion. <laughs> And then they progressed into uh, into becoming a jazz college. And back in 64, nobody really graduated from there because the degree meant nothing. Nobody, you know, you couldn't <laughs> teach anywhere. You couldn't do anything. It was like they give you a piece of paper that said you're a graduate of Berkeley. Uh, not like <laughs> today. I understand today, you know, with 25,000 drummers and 25,000 guitar players. And I guess it's a lot different now, but yeah. nobody graduated. You know, uh, Woody Herman would come through. He'd pick up two saxophones and a trumpet. Maynard Ferguson would come through, pick up two trombones, saxophone, trumpet. <laughs> so the guys were just leaving left and right. But the guys I went to college with were phenomenal. I mean, uh, John Abercrombie on guitar. Oh. Trying to think of some. Gary Burton was uh, playing vibes. And we, had, we had a fun time. We had a really fun time. Oh, that's my stuff right there. All those old ECM records. Oh, uh, yeah, Abercrombie. I, 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 that's my, that's my music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know it was, did you play it, with it, him it, back then? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was, he was a roommate of ours. So we got to jam all the time. God. And at the time there was the jazz workshop and Paul's mall were in Boston. And that's where we got to see Miles Davis and Dexter Gordon and, uh, oh, wow. uh, Bill Evans. And, you know, we'd sit right in front of these people as they played. And it was, it was so phenomenal. And for, it was like $2. If you were a student, you get in. And then I later played the club myself with the band. I had a rock band that was uh, pretty hot. We used to open for the B-52s and, uh, Patty <laughs> really? Smith. yeah, it was called New York Mary. And, uh, <laughs> when I was, when I was working with Benny Goodman, it was pretty funny because here I am working with Benny Goodman. And my two friends, um, <clears throat> Rick Patrone and, and Bruce Johnstone, were working with Maynard Ferguson's band. And we got together one day and we, uh, we were friends with Lou Soloff, the trumpet player. So we said, hey, let's make a CD. Let's just, you know, hack around. You guys write some tunes. And we'll... So we write this uh, uh, arrangement on a couple of really heavy tunes. And uh, we go up to a studio, we record it. And John Hammond heard it. And now John Hammond was Benny Goodman's brother-in-law. I don't know if you guys knew that. Oh. Alice. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. Benny's wife, Alice, was a Hammond. And John Hammond was responsible for finding Bob Dylan and Aretha Franklin and, you know, a lot of heavyweights. And he heard the tape and he flipped out and he sold it to uh, Clive Davis. So we have two albums out on Arista. Uh, New York nice. Mary was the name of the band. Yeah. So it's kind of <laughs> funny. Here I am playing this old time music. And in the meantime, I'm in a studio recording this progressive jazz rock album. So <laughs> it was great. It was great. <laughs> Yeah. I gotta look that up, man. Yeah. New York, New York Mary. Mary. That's a cool name too. Is there a story behind the name? 
Uh, yeah, it's a prostitute in New York City. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's absolutely gorgeous. And uh, we're all in love with her. So I said, what's your name? And she said, Mary. And I said, oh, that's cool. And then we, then we came back, we said, what should we call a band? We said, how about New York Mary? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if she gets a piece of the action or not. I'm trying to figure out if she gets any royalties. <laughs> well, did you guys get any? <laughs> oh, God, I know. I know. Fine. Fun times. You so, know, that- and when you hang, you know, when you, it's, it's an all together different bag when you're, you know, you're playing rock music because the, the musicians you meet, you know, like uh, uh, Jeff Picaro, uh, we opened for Toto one time and Jeff oh, cool. was, he stayed in the next room from me and we would get together and just do drum things, you know, practice with our, with our sticks on a bed and we would just talk and some of these guys are so great. So, so great. I've heard he was the nicest guy, man. Really? Picaro. Really? Yeah. And a great drummer. Great, great drummer. Yeah, yeah. for sure. It's yep. cool you were so open-minded style-wise and not just like uh, tunnel vision into one type of bag, you know? No, I like, uh, you know, some of my favorites are like Peter Erskine. Peter Erskine mm-hmm. is, is a drummer that, uh, <clears throat> he doesn't call a drum set a drum set, he calls it an instrument. I mean, he really, it's, it's like every time he plays, it's like making love to a woman. It's like every stroke, everything he does is just absolutely incredible. And it's so meaningful, you know, when you when you watch yeah. him play uh, versus other drummers, you know, uh, especially rock drummers. Um, I did a couple of things with Paige Hamilton, uh, who has that heavy metal band called Helmet. And uh, mm-hmm. when I fly out to California, uh, he <coughs> plays like that. And uh, he's a great jazz guitar player. And we have such a great mm-hmm. time. But then when I hear his, uh, I hear his rock band, you know, it's just, I don't know how these guys do it. And they do it for hours and hours. <laughs> I need oxygen and ambulance standing by. I said, no, I can't do that. I can't do it. So, yeah. Yeah, Peter Erskine was a drummer. It's the night that I decided I was going to become a musician. Oh. It was a Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was 17. It was weather report with... Erskine and Robert Thomas Jr. on percussion, and you know, obviously uh, Wayne Solid. Joe Jocko. Yeah, I just and I just saw it. I just had a vision. I was like, whatever. I don't care what I have to go through. It, I just got so inspired. And Erskine is he's a painter, man. Like yeah. he could yeah. just play cymbals. Right. <laughs> you right. could take away all the drums and no, get I, fully inspired you know i've seen him in so so many different settings it's just uh you know he's such a you know he's an inspiration for me i mean even even later even later in life now when i watch him play you know uh we play with a lot of the same people and uh like right now i've been playing with the saxophone player george garzon who's uh, oh yeah of, yeah and uh i'm hoping you know that that'll take off but did you COVID, know uh Speaking of guard zone, did you know Bob Galati? Oh yeah, sure, very well. Okay. Yeah, I was uh, I was playing with uh, George the night that Bob passed away. Yeah, and that oh, was horrible. That wow. Was horrible. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. What was that band they had in Boston? Oh, that must have been terrible. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I found out about Garzon because I did a, a record with Bob Galati with uh, Trey oh. Anastasio. Oh, and okay. some of the guys from uh, Sun Ra's orchestra. Oh, and uh, Mark Rebo and yeah. uh, Medeski, John Medeski. Yeah. And then um, and Bob Galati. It was John Fishman from Fish on Drums and Bob Galati. Was, we had two oh. drummers yeah. and hanging with him and the stories. And I got that. What's the name? The Fringe, right? That was. The oh, name yeah. The it? Fringe. That was it. Fringe. That was the name. Yeah. With Garzon. Yeah. Yeah, well, this the band we're in is a quartet. It's piano, bass, drums, and George. So it's a little more down down to earth. <laughs> well, yeah, that was like out there. Oh, the friends was... Tell me about it. I know, I know. <laughs> well, Trav- he's, he's a funny guy, man. He is. I love him. I love him. Man. He's a great, great player, too. Tra- traveling all over the world, touring at such a young age, too, must have like really opened you up to so many different influences and different types of music while you were out on the road well it introduced me to anxiety attacks is what it introduced me <laughs> I mean, I, you know i played when i played at the royal albert hall uh, in front of the queen and paul mccartney and who else was oh. in the audience uh 
Rex Harrison. There was a whole bunch of uh, actors and actresses, and it was standing room only at the, and then Benny Goodman for the first time. We we never played it before, and uh, he said, "Now I'd like to feature my drummer Joe Corsello on Sing Sing Sing." And I went, "Oh my God!" And I got so nervous that I actually had to hold on with my right hand on the floor tom tom because I thought I was either vomit or I was going to pass out. Wow. So, yeah, but wow. We, we made it through. <laughs> it's a young age, though, man. Yeah, it's I know. A young age. Well, these guys all took me under their wing, and it was it was it was great, you know, because I, had I known what I was getting myself into, I don't think I would have accepted it, you know. I mean, it was it was pretty tough at a young age, you know. I think it was a lot too soon. I think you know when you when you're going up that ladder of whatever it is, you know, trying to get better and practicing. And all of a sudden you get that call, you know, uh, that, that's a heavy call. And I didn't realize it. And I guess that's why I kept my cool in the beginning. But then I started realizing that, uh, man, Benny Goodman is really still a heavyweight. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean, it's people like going into the Royal Albert Hall that day. I mean, you know, people, it was a whole crowd of people outside when the limousine pulled up and they were trying to rip our clothes. Not, well, I don't mean, you know, but they were wanted a piece yeah. of you. Like they wanted your autograph. They wanted, I said, holy smokes, you know, here's wow. a guy I thought died 20 years ago and he's still a big, big time, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's a little freaky. It was, it was freaky, like I said, and it did cause a lot of anxiety. It caused a lot of anxiety. And I, uh, whether I was ready for it, I, I'm not sure if that had the problem or, or what it was, but it was just, it was nerve wracking. And then, you know, you start getting written up in magazines and, you, you know, in 1972, uh, Playboy magazine had a jazz and pop poll. And I came out in fourth place as the, you know, one. and then, then you're thinking when you're up on the stage playing, there's so many guys out in the audience that want your job. So you've <laughs> got to do a really good job and you've got to be, you know, on top of the ball all the time. You know, your practice has to be that way. And it's just, it was pretty scary. It was pretty scary. Now at my age now, I see material. <laughs> uh, hindsight is always the best, but people don't yeah. realize, you know, like the, the, uh, how hard it is to process all the other stuff or even right. how much of all the other stuff there is mm -hmm. because fame is like, you know, I didn't get a real big break till I was 32 with the mm -hmm. Holman brothers, man. And that's when I started having to deal with like just all the other stuff, you know, I mean, and it's a lot and I, I wasn't ready at 32. It's really yeah. just surviving it, you know, and then you look back when you're older, and you go, oh, yeah, well, how was I supposed to be able to understand that back then? Well, Warren, Warren Haynes is still like, uh, you know, he lives right up the street here in, in Bedford and uh, yeah. in Bedford, New York. And uh, he records at the studio that I do a lot of work in the carriage house. He does a lot of his yeah. recording. And it was so funny because uh, there was a girl one time I was going out to the NAMM show. Zildjian Simples has me go out there and, and I don't know why they have me go out there, and, you know, <laughs> sign autographs. Hey, you want my autograph? Who are you? Uh, uh, that's okay. But anyway, um, uh, she said to me, oh, oh my God, you're going to, if you see Warren Haynes, would you tell him, oh, could I get an autograph? Could I have him sign anything? I don't care. So I'm saying, who the hell is Warren Haynes? You know, <laughs> being a jazz drummer, what do I know about rock rockers? So I'm saying, uh, okay, I don't, I never heard of this guy. That's thought it'd be simple for me. So when I go out there, I had a, I had a, like a 15 minute break at the booth. So I said, could you tell me where the uh, where Warren Haynes is going to be? They said, oh, Warren Haynes. Oh, yeah. Well, he's around the corner, blah, blah, blah. And they just told me how to get there. So I said, oh, good. I can run over there real quick and get a maybe a signed 8 by 10 of Warren Haynes. So I, I swing around the corner, and I see this line. And the line's out the door uh, where the NAMM show is in Anaheim, out the door, around the corner. And I said to somebody in line, I said, excuse me. I said, could you tell me where Warren Haynes is? He said, that's why we're in line. I went, holy Christ. I had my, I had my Zildjian badge and my Ludwig drum badge. So I figured, well, I'm going to try to see if I could pull a quick one. So I went into the back of it and I said, listen, I'm here with Zildjian symbols and blah, blah, blah. I said, Could, I got to get this autograph for this chick. I said, please. I said, whatever you can do. He said, oh, yeah, 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 no problem. So we go behind Warren Hayes. He's at the, he's at the table signing autographs and everything. So he, he taps him on his shoulder. He goes, he said, Warren, could you do this young man a favor? He said, he's trying to get an autograph for a chick. And, he says, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. What's your name? And I said, no, it's not to me. I said, it's this girl, Vicky. And he says, oh, yeah, sure. So he reaches in his box and he pulls out an 8 by 10 a color picture, and he signs it to Vicky. And, man, when I brought it on, she went absolutely insane. But it just goes <laughs> to show you, I had no idea who Warren Haynes is. <laughs> <laughs>
It's like Benny Goodman. <laughs> <laughs> you can't know everything, man. I said the the older I get, the more I realize how out of touch I am. Somebody's like, "Hey, you know, have you heard this?" And I'm like, "Never even heard of it." You know, know. they look at me like I'm an idiot, which is probably true. <laughs> What's up, everybody? This is Mike, and today's show is sponsored by Sunset Lake CBD, a Vermont hemp farm crafting affordable CBD products designed to help with stress and sleep without breaking the bank. Sunset Lake CBD is a majority employee-owned hemp farm located just outside of one of our favorite places, Burlington, Vermont. For years, Sunset Lake was a dairy farm producing milk for Ben & Jerry's ice cream. We had them on the podcast. In 2019, they diversified and started growing hemp for CBD. And Sunset Lake CBD crafts products with hemp grown on their family farm and ships them directly to the customer, cutting out all the cost associated with getting on the shelves at stores. They have CBD products for every occasion and offer tinctures, salves, edibles, coffee, smokables and even for that anxious dog of yours they have pet products oh i need to get some for my dog that's barking all the time but Mm -hmm. i'll tell you this i use these the sour bears so good they are cbd gummies i literally no joke i take these every night they help me sleep And it's almost bedtime. (laughs) Yep. And I still, as I said it before, I'll say it again. You go to a long show, you come home, my 42-year-old ankles are not what they used to be. And I rub that salve all over them and uh, put them up, enjoy a a nice cocktail, and uh, just let it ooze right into those sore bones. And you know what, folks? All you comes a time fans, if you check them out at sunsetlakecbd.com and use promo code TIME, T-I-M-E, you'll get 20% off all products. That's sunsetlakecbd.com. Use promo code TIME, 20% off all products. Sunset Lake CBD, farmer-owned, Vermont-grown. Thank you. Get you some. Well, no, I mean, you know, when you talk to the younger kids today, it's funny because, you know, a lot of times when they introduce me, they say, formerly with Benny Goodman, Peggy Lee, this one, that one, Sandler and Young, Shecky Green, you know, they have no idea who these people are. So, Shecky. They might as well be saying, uh, you know, Santa Claus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Shecky Green was just the funniest man I ever worked with in my entire life. He was just, come on, oh. give us some Shecky, man, for, <laughs> for Mike. <laughs> Well, when I was working, I was working with Sergio uh, Franchi and uh, and <clears throat> we're out at Westbury in New York and uh, the opening act was going to be Shecky Green. And, um, you know, I knew Shecky Green, uh, obviously, as being a comedian and everything, but I know I'd never met him and I never really uh, got into any of his uh, into any of his works. But uh, I'm down in the pit with the orchestra. We're rehearsing uh, Sergio Franchi. And we're ready to leave. And somebody says, would you mind just saying behind the drum set down here in the pit? And as Shecky says some funny stuff, could you just smash a cymbal or hit a drum, you know, a drum or something? Yes. I said, yeah, sure. I said, I have no problem with that. I got no place to go. I said, that'd be fun. So the show starts, Shecky comes out. And I'll tell you what, I laughed my ass. He kept looking down at me because I was hysterical. I was hysterical. Every time he said a joke, I was like, oh, my God. I would... You know, and, and crashing the cymbal sounded like my head against it. I mean, it was just so funny. Yeah. <laughs> so the next morning, I'm going down. We stayed at the Holiday Inn, and uh, I'm, I'm getting in the elevator. Who's in the elevator? But Shecky Green, and he's like in a little uh, sweatsuit and everything. He was he was he was unbelievable. And he says, "You're that drummer." And I said, "Yeah." And he says, "Can I hire you?" And I said, "For what?" And he said, "I oh man." He said, "You're funny as hell." He said, "I said I'm funny as hell." I said, "You were hysterical last night." He said, no, I'll give you 600 bucks if you could sit down in the pit for this week and just, you know, be there. I said, I'll be there. <laughs> and so he and I became really good friends. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's a riot. He's a riot. Oh, man, it, that's man. so cool. And I understand he's still alive. He's living out in, uh, my friends see him out in uh, the place outside of California where they all go, all the actors and uh, uh, a lot of, of my music. 
No, not uh, Vegas. Um, oh, I th- I'm playing good. I, I can't remember the name. We were, we talked about it the other day. I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, God, my mind I can't remember blank. the name. Yeah. I can imagine these guys getting like together the valley or something. For their, for their martini lunches. It's got to be absolutely yeah. hysterical. <laughs> oh. <laughs> or imagine being a waiter in that room. My goodness. Being man. a server, just cracking up. <laughs> well, I, I'm always fascinated by what travel was like. Like, you know, when you were going out on tour, even in the States, like, were, was it predominantly by plane and then staying for long periods of time? Or would you fly out to a gig and then kind of drive from spot to spot? Like, what was that like? No, we would fly everywhere and the limousines would pick us up and take us to where we were going. Uh, but obviously, flying was so much easier. Uh, the bass players would actually carry their bass onto the plane and have to buy a ticket for a seat and they would strap the bass down. Yeah. Now you can't even fit the bass in the seat on a plane because they didn't give you enough (laughs) leg room. No, no. uh, Now now when we travel, the bass has to go into a coffin and it goes in the belly of the plane. But, uh, yeah, I used to travel with my drums. I used to, uh, Benny Goodman had a house in St. Martin. And um, we used to, every January and February, he would take us down there as a vacation. We would stay at the Mullet Bay Beach Hotel. And the understanding was that, you know, we would play Saturday nights, just the band, not him, um, for dinner. And uh, so I went down for two months down in, uh, in, in St. Martin. And I, I went down as Joe Corsello, came back as Tyrone Corsello, because I was so black, it was like ridiculous. You know, just being in that <laughs> sun, man. Oh, beautiful. It was beautiful. <laughs> But to get down there, especially have, living up in the Northeast, that's a great way to yeah, spend right. the winter. That's the that's the hard part of winter too. January, oh, yeah. February. Oh yeah, yeah. So wow. it, was, it was wonderful. But we had to fly into Puerto Rico and then take a uh, a plane over to St. Martin. So when I was in uh, Puerto Rico, they completely took my drums apart. I mean, they took all the heads off. They were, you know, the security. And I said, "What are you doing that for?" I said, "You know." And they said, "Oh, you know why?" And blah blah. blah. And I said, "Okay." So they took the drums completely apart. And uh, looking for cocaine, looking for drugs, looking whatever whatever it was they were looking for. But I thought that was that was probably the most difficult one that I had. But other than that, it was it was travel with the drums. You put them in the belly of the plane, and you know, uh, pray. That, you just hop on a plane and get them when you get off, and that was it. It's always yeah. fascinating being in New York City and seeing you know uh, someone running for the train with an upright bass. <laughs> on a, in a case like on wheels and it's like hold the door for him hold the door. it's like and then they get it onto the train and it's just to to stand there and you know yeah no one gives up their seat or anything and you're just kind of watching them that, that's such a like a, a rough instrument to right navigate right yeah. i mean like to be able to like especially in the city to race back and forth with an upright i, I don't know how they do it man I don't know how they do it, but I, I did see a violin player the other day that makes $300 cash a day. And I said, I don't know if I would have had Channel 2 interviewing me because the IRS is going to be calling me soon. He <laughs> plays down on the subway, you know, he wears a tuxedo oh. and he plays the shit out of the, out of the violin. I mean, it's just unbelievable violinist. But, he, you know, he has a little case there and people throw money in. And he makes 300 bucks a day. I'm saying I should do that with my snare drum. Maybe just go hang out in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's a kind of an interesting thing. Oh, I don't know if I ever told you about this. That I, I saw a, a a piece about how the whole subway musician world, like there are certain train stops at certain times. That's like the playing the Radio City Music Hall of yeah. the underground subway. <laughs> like if you get Times Square, get the best money. To- yeah, if you get like Times Square at like rush hour, that's yeah. like the gig. Where meanwhile, someone's like out in Queens, like kind of, yeah, chew, you know, like kind of cutting their teeth, working their way up, up, working their way up to Grand Central, you know, <laughs> and, and it's a whole thing. And it's true. Like, and it's like the more you put in and the more like the harder you work yeah. in that station, the more that you kind of get like moved. It's really interesting. I didn't even know there was like a whole booking, a whole business, dude, the underground whole, or making yeah. a living. Oh really my God! I, you know, <laughs> I don't know. We're in a different world now, I guess. Yeah. So, so Joe, great. when you when you were get, like coming up, did you used to? Because um, starting at five years old, I mean, was that was drums essentially your life? Like, were you just eat, sleep, play the drums? That was it. That was it. And then my dad took me to a concert uh, when I was about eleven or twelve years old here in Stamford uh, with the Dave Brubeck Quartet. 
and Love John you. Fellow was playing drums, and that was it. From that moment on, I I said, "This is it. This is my career." And uh, and Joe and I, ironically, became really good friends. We were best friends. We talked every day on the phone. Wow, and that's great. It felt so terrible for Joe. Joe was just. You know, when you, when you say to somebody, have you ever heard of Dave Brubeck? They go, oh, yeah. Oh, man, take five. That drum solo is unbelievable. And, you know, and I have to laugh a lot because poor Joe lived in a basement apartment in Irvington, New Jersey, mm-hmm. where it was, I had the highest homicide rate. There was always a body outside of his uh, front door, either mm-hmm. shot or burned. And, you know, he would turn his water on and cockroaches would come out of it. <clears throat> Jeez. And here's Dave Brubeck living up in Wilton, Connecticut, you know, with uh, servants and, uh, you know, in a mansion. But when you <coughs> when you ask them about what song, it was always take five with the drum solo. You know? With the drum solo. Even the young people, because they use it on commercials now, they use it, you know. And uh, I just felt so bad for Joe. And, and Joe, uh, towards the end, was in really bad shape. Yeah. It's hard. Like, you know, I saw it was hard still is watching my heroes you know just everybody it, you can reach a certain point artistically it could be the pinnacle mm-hmm. it doesn't mean it's like we're talking about like all the other stuff yeah it's right just life stuff man yeah that, uh, no i know and they don't get that they don't get the they don't reach the pinnacle in those uh, in those other categories you know no and then the you, you know then you get confronted with like uh you know the COVID. The COVID just ruined me. Mm. I mean, that just took me right out of the... I was in the Dominican Republic and I played the jazz festivals uh, back in March of uh, when, when COVID, 2020? 2020, 2020. Yeah. yeah. And flew back to New York and uh, the customs agent told me to just go home and sit there for 14 days. And I said, what? I said, for what? And then he told me about what was going on. And when I got home, my phone started ringing. And I was supposed to go to Bologna to do a concert. I was supposed to go yeah, to France. Well, I was supposed to go to Germany. And next to each cross out I was doing, I was putting down the money that I was losing. And uh, I just got to a point where I just said, you know what? I hadn't had a drink in 27 years. I went down to a liquor store. I said, give me a bottle of vodka. Oh. I, said, what? I said, anything you got. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And then... Uh, I went to the convenience store. I hadn't had a cigarette in 25 years. And I said, give me a pack of cigarettes. What kind? I don't care. They oh. gave me a pack of cigarettes. And I started smoking and drinking again. So, and it's been that way ever since. It's been, I don't mean the smoking and drinking, but I mean the, the music part. It's just, it's been horrible. It's, it's almost worse now that COVID's over. There's just nothing happened musically. There's nobody's playing anywhere. You know, they got these, uh, you go into a, uh, a restaurant that has music and, uh, you know, the guy said, oh man, I would love to have you in here. It's wonderful, you know. How much? I don't know. Give us, give us six hundred bucks for a quartet or something. How's that? Six hundred bucks? Are you kidding me? I got kids in here that pay me to come in and play. I ain't paying six hundred bucks, you know. So that's what you're up against in the music business. Yeah, <clears throat> that's yeah, kind of sad. Man. Yeah. And, and well, hopefully it'll it, it'll start to come back. Some. Uh, it looks like many things have changed. I wonder how many of them are going to be permanent changes. Yeah, well, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it yet. I mean, the jazz festivals haven't really opened up. And, and you know, and they like New Orleans, the jazz festival uh, uh, consisted of uh, uh, what they have. Uh, they were all rock and rollers. And there was you can count yeah. the jazz musicians on one hand, you know. And I guess so is, Europe's, kind of- is Europe still closed up now because of yeah. spikes and stuff? Yeah. yeah, so you can't even go overseas. No. Man. no. Oh, and then, and then you know, not that I'm a perfectionist in any way, and not that I'm a, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll basically play with anybody. I mean, if it's fun and the person, I, I have a feeling the person knows what he's doing, I'll play and have a good time with it. But, you know, the people that you play with downtown here or have these 50 rock bands and that kind of stuff, it's just, uh, you know, they're, they're carpenters during the week and then on Saturday night they whip out their guitar and you know they know three chords and would you come and play with me I said no geez I'm sorry I gotta sort my sock drawer that night or something you know <laughs> yeah it's just it's yeah it's tough it's it's really tough so yeah COVID hit everything hard oh yeah so, man tell us how did you end up getting the gig with Sonny Rollins uh we used to have a uh, um a jazz conference 
Uh, they said they had it a couple of times in California and then they had it in New York. It was the NIJE, the National Jazz Educators Conference. And I would go down because I was running a, a school out of the Palace uh, uh, Theater and I had a summer jazz for kids and uh, it was very successful. So I would go down to the, uh, to the jazz conference and uh, my brother, who is uh, probably one of the heavier uh, recording engineers in the, in the world, um, uh, happened to be at the show and uh, he was recording Sonny Rollins at that time at a studio in, in New York City. And my brother saw me, uh, you know, walking around in the conference and he said to me, he said, hey, why don't you come across the street and audition for Sonny? I said, what are you talking about? And he said, yeah, Sonny's auditioning drummers for this new record he's doing. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I said, me, Sonny Rollins? I said, you're out of your mind. He says, no, 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 you should. He said, because uh, Steve Jordan was going to be going with Eric Clapton and he was going to be leaving uh, uh, Sonny. So I thought about it. I thought about it. I didn't sleep that night. I said, you know what? I'm going to go over and try it. What the hell, man? I can't lose anything. So I went over and, you know, we played, uh, we played a, a, a tune in three, in three, four. And he said, that's the, that's the beat I'm looking for. That's the beat I'm looking for. God damn it. You know, so I left. And I said, I thought he was saying God damn it to me. Like, get this guy out of here. You know, bring the next guy in. So that night I get a call from his agent. And, uh, and that's how I started with uh, Sonny. And I started with Sonny by doing the album, Sonny Please. And that, that's my, <laughs> that was my audition with Sonny. <laughs> wow. You have these no pressure, low pressure auditions all the time. <laughs> it's so funny when I, you know, I think back, I, I laugh about it. I'm saying, man, you know, what happened when I went into the army band? Jeez, I had to play for like three hours, you know, read every kind of music there was, you know, it was crazy, you know, but these guys are just, you know, they hear you play and they, they feel good and, you know, you're hired, so. It was nice, but Sonny had like a, uh, uh, Sonny, we had Bobby Broom on guitar. Uh, we had Bob Cranshaw, who and I ended oh, up being best of friends. They he's know, Bob, the best. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And I played with him a month before he passed, and it was just, oh, God. Who was on drums with Cranshaw? Uh, oh, what, you? Duh, I was well, thinking. <laughs> it was me. I was thinking it, Grady Tate, because when I see Cranshaw, I always think of oh, Grady Tate. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. No, uh. <laughs> It was uh, it was Steve. Steve Jordan was with yeah. uh, Sonny for a long time, before. and then he went with uh, he went with Eric Clapton. And um, I talked to him about two or three months ago. And Steve is now with the Rolling Stones. He's the new mm -hmm. drummer with the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Which they have not announced, which I find that very hard to believe. I'm listening to all those <laughs> interviews with all the Rolling Stone guys, and nobody's mentioning Steve. But uh, I'm sure he's got to be happy, and I'm sure he's looking for an estate up in Beverly Hills. Right <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he changed his number. I'll say Joe Crusoe. Joe who? I don't know. <laughs> so you, you used to run a – you ran, you ran a school for uh, young yeah, I drummers? A, I, I ran a school. Uh, what happened in 1978, uh, all the music in New York City was moving out to California. Johnny Carson show, all the different shows, and uh, – the record dates that I was involved in, and I was doing most of the, there was a guy, a gentleman, Don Elliott, that lived up here in Western Connecticut. He had a studio that was incredible. And I did a lot of work with Quincy Jones, who'd come out to the studio and, and, and wow. uh, lay such, you know, tracks down. I mean, it was from, uh, I'm going to say Quincy Jones, all the way to like Alan Arkin. Alan Arkin used to come in and used to do these little kids wow. uh, music things. And so they would use me on drums. So I was the house drummer at the studio. <clears throat> and um, uh, so all the music was going out to California. I saw that I wasn't doing any more jingles. I mean, I used to go to the 802 office in New York City at Roseland Dance. And, you know, once a week and just pick up a pile of checks that were, you know, uh, residuals from a lot of the commercials that I had done. And, um, you know, it was great. I mean, music was plentiful then. You know, I was playing seven nights a week and I was traveling and it was just, it was unbelievable. But um, at that point, I saw everything coming to a, coming to a, a, a hall. So I said, you know what, I need a couple of more credits so I could get a degree. And I said, what should I do? And at the time I was married, wife wanted to have children. Uh, we had just moved into a new house. And I said, I got to do something. I got to do something. So I enrolled at UConn here in Stanford. And um, uh the professor, uh, I took a psychology course and a sociology course. The professor was the new police chief. 
that was coming into Stanford from Menlo Park, California. And this guy was, he was a conservative right down the middle. I mean, a little lefty, but it was okay. And he was going to change, you know, he was going to change a lot of things. And <clears throat> one night after class, he said to me, uh, could you stay? He said, I'd like to talk to you about something. And I said, okay. And he said, you want to go get a, a, a pizza and some beer down at the Mario's and which is a place right down here in Stanford. And I said, yeah, sure. You know, so in the meantime, I'm checking my pockets for joints or for anything I like seeds. Or, but anyway, <laughs> I got in this car and I'm, I'm with this new police chief now and feeling pretty good. And, uh, you know, we go down, we have pizza and beer. And he said to me, he said, you ever think about becoming a cop? And I said, you gotta be kidding me. He goes, no, 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 really. He said, you know, I love your, your work, your, you know, your, your, your social attitude towards people and this kind of thing. I said, you gotta be kidding me. He goes, no, 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 I'm serious. He said, they're giving the test. He said, can I put your name on the list? I said, no. So I went home, I said, talk to my ex-wife. I said, what do you think? She said, you'd make a great cop. You, oh man, you make a great cop. You're such a pain in the, you know. So uh, he put my name on the list. I think I know. I get this letter in the mail saying the test is going to be on such and such a date. Come on down and take it. Now with my five points, because I was in the army, uh, they gave me five points towards the test. So lo and behold, a guy who can't pass a test gets a 98.6 <laughs> with the five points. So I was like the top hitter of all these people that took the test. So he calls me up. He said, you're in, you're in. And I said, what do you mean I'm in? He says, you go in front of the police commission now and you're all set. I go the police commission. So I go in front of the police commission and I'm doing everything he's telling me to do because I was trying to get a good grade from him and get my degree. So I go in front of the police commission and there was a woman, uh, the police commission. She said, I see you're a drummer. And I said, yeah. She said, you know anything about police work? I said, not a thing. And she said, well, if we ever have a police band, you could play the drums in the police band. And I said, yeah, I could. So anyway, I get this card. It says, you, uh, you have just joined the Stanford Police Department. Report for duty on June 6th, 1980. I remember because that was the day I had to go in. So they sent me away to the State Police Academy for 10 weeks and graduated, came out, uh, started working uh, on the street for about a year or two years. I took the detective's test because I, I didn't want to be a cop at all. And, and my background was like, I never gave a ticket, never arrested. I, I didn't do anything. So I, uh, I take the test to become a detective. To, uh, so they had a burglary squad. I said, that would be good. I don't have to deal with people. So I became a detective. <laughs> And uh, so that took me out of uniform, which was great. And then uh, a year later, I took the test for homicide. So, <coughs> excuse me, I, uh, become, I became a homicide detective. Uh, and, and you're looking at a guy that if I cut myself shaving, I would have to sit down because I was ready to faint. You know? So anyway, uh, you know, you just keep working. You know, if you do these things, you're working your way up the ladder, you know. You go from a simple little knifing where a guy dies. Okay, it's a little hole. You go to a shooting where it's just a little hole. But then you get to the big ones, you know. But then you're ready for the big ones. And back then, we had to actually go to the autopsies. Oh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, I couldn't do that. I'm ready yeah. to faint. Yeah, and the doctors are eating uh, uh, donuts and having coffee. <laughs> Come here, look at this. Look at this. Look, you know. You're holding so, on yeah. to the floor, Tom, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And here's a guy that suffered from anxiety attacks and hated blood. Okay, so I'm a homicide detective. So about five years before wow. I retired, I only did 20 years because I said, that's it. I'm not doing it anymore. So five years before I retired, they uh, came up with a thing called community policing. Now, I had been working in this uh, low rent village type thing here in Stanford. Uh, it's called Southfield Village. And uh, the people, they were great. But I mean, that's where all the homicides were, the stabbing, the drug dealings, the whole, everything. Um, so uh, when the chief called me and he was a new chief, he was a state police colonel uh, now in Stanford. And he was our new police chief. And he said, uh, there was four of us. And he said, we have this thing called community policing. And he said, I want you to come up with some, some ideas for uh, what you guys could do. So he asked me, he said, I want you to lead a squad in Southfield Village. And he said, think of something uh, that you'd like to do for the kids. So uh, we came back from a meeting the following week. And one guy said, I'm going to start a basketball team. Oh, OK, how original that is. Uh, we're going to start a baseball team. OK, that's pretty funny. OK, uh, how about you? Oh, we can do a football team. Oh, that's great. 
how about you? I said, I'd like to open a school of music for the children. And he looked at me and he said, what? And I said, I'd like to open a school of music for the children, for the kids. And he said, what an idea. He said, are you kidding? He said, how are you going to do this? I said, I'll speak to the head of housing. I'll see if I can get a bungalow. We'll turn it into a studio. I'll hire some musicians. They can come in and teach the kids. And I'll go around and see if I can get instruments. So anyway, it took me about six or eight weeks to put the whole program together. Huh. And I ended up with about 30 or 40 children uh, playing cellos, basses, flutes, violins, huh. drums. And it ended up being a pilot program for the whole country. So. Wow. Yeah. The rest of the cop oh, hated me because I really, you know, wasn't involved in law enforcement, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it was a great, it was a great feeling for me. It was a great feeling for me. And yeah, the kids, it, I still see some of the kids today and they're still playing music and, and, you know, it's, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. That's great. It's yeah. such a jazz way of doing things. Like you're, you're like, <laughs> I got to throw away my uh, pot seeds and now you're a homicide detective. And then you open a school for music for kids. It's like, what, I love that. That. what the hell? Dude? What an amazing story. <laughs> that's wow. great, man. Oh, no, man, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So it, it worked out. And then they uh, they knocked the whole village down and took the music program out. And, you know, the chiefs keep calling me, uh, you know, every now and then they'll call me and say, you know, do you think you could try to put that thing back together again? And I said, I don't know, let's talk. I and mean, they never called me back. So, oh, yeah, geez. I guess they have more important things to do. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, but it was, it, you know, my life was, uh, it was fun. It was fun, you know, and I keep going. Like tonight, uh, they're going to have music next door to where I'm living. Uh, and uh, they have a great uh, jazz band in there, a good trumpet player from uh, up in New Haven. And he brings a quartet in. And, you know, maybe I'll have a chance to sit in and play. So I, I, I really do have a lot of fun. I have yeah. a lot of fun with the, you know, and, and it's tough for me now because I can't set my drums up in the apartment. So that's the bummer. Yeah, yeah. This thing really. What's that? Do you do any teaching still? Uh, No, I was. I was teaching uh, prior to my girlfriend throwing me out of the house two years ago. I was teaching up at her house, and well, I should say it was my house, but I gave it to her. Um, I was teaching up there, and uh, I had about four or five really good students from Manhattan School of Music would come up, and uh, I would go through their proficiency with them, and uh, you know. Not not little kids, but uh, people yeah. that could play. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. This whole thing through through quite a quite a pothole in the road for for us. But uh, you know, you've got you've got a lot ahead of you, and you've got a lot of great stuff to offer everybody. So please keep it up. And uh, yeah, man. You know, it's it's being around you and getting to meet you like it's you've got such a great spirit and it's it's really an honor to to chat with you and and get to hear your story and... well this was great this was great you guys are, are really cool and uh <laughs> you know that was it was it, it got me thinking <laughs> good <laughs> there's plenty more to come man so you know and I'll, I'll i'll be seeing you down at the cigar shop uh, oh yeah please come back please come back man you're hysterical you're oh, the best thank you. yet <laughs> oh, <laughs> i appreciate that but, yeah, um, definitely. Thank you very much. And we don't want to take up. Yeah, you know, thank you so much. Day, but thank you guys. Thank you guys, man. This was this was really great. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll see you soon. All right. Keep yeah, in touch. We'll be in touch. We will be. Right, Absolutely. Mike. Thank you, Jeff. Right, Stay safe. Bye-bye. Keep on swinging. Yeah. <laughs> okay.